Hello, welcome to Choosing Your Own Adventure, Where Do Video Games and Storytelling Meet? Sponsored by Coffeehouse Press and the Loft Literary Center. I'm Chris Fishbach, I'm the publisher at Coffeehouse Press. Uh, so this panel is the first of what may possibly turn into a series of collaborative discussions, public events hosted and curated by Coffeehouse and the Loft. Uh, with the current uh, idea being that it will be around literature and technology. Uh, will be the unifying series theme. Tonight is a sort of pilot to that effect, and it's generally sponsored by Best Buy. So Best Buy is paying for your food tonight. Um, the specific topic for tonight was chosen because of the Loft's first ever writing the video game narrative class, taught by panelist uh, Reinhard Suarez. Starts October 30th, but space is filling up. Stop by the Loft info table out front, or visit theloft.org to sign up. Uh, the Loft is also taking registrations for its Nature and Environmental Writing Conference uh, for the more than 70 and for this more than 75 fall creative writing classes to start in September. And if you turn in the little pieces of paper asking questions about uh, video games and character uh, in the basket out front, we're, the Loft is giving away one free enrollment to uh, Reinhardt's class. Uh, Coffee House's interest in video games is at this point theoretical. Uh, and a question of curiosity. <laughs> also, one of our writers, Brian Evanson, under the pen name B.K. Evanson, writes video game fiction for the Dead Space series and for Halo. Uh, stop by the Coffee House Press to ta Coffee House Press table to sign up for our mailing list, grab a catalog, and we also have some books for sale. Uh, and we're also doing a drawing tonight too. If you sign up, you will win all of our fall titles. And this Saturday from 12 to 2, we're hosting our speed submissions event at Open Field at the Walker Art Center. And you can come by and pitch your book idea or your manuscript to any of our editors. So the Loft's class description is, using BioWare's Mass Effect trilogy of video games as our example, we'll delve into the phenomena of new media storytelling by taking a craft-oriented look at this exciting trilogy as a work not only of interactive story, but ultimately crowdsourced narrative. And tonight's panelists are Andy McNamara. Hello. Andy began his career as a game journalist back in 1991, writing reviews for Game Informer's premier issue. By 1994, he was named editor-in-chief and has been running the magazine's content and creation ever since. However, Game Informer is no longer just a video game magazine. With over 8 million subscribers, an award-winning website, and a digital footprint on PC, Mac, iPad, and Android, and print editions available as far away as Australia, Game Informer's influence and content distribution has grown significantly in over its 20 years of business. Erica Stevens is the poetry editor at large for Coffeehouse Press and is writer and editor for Hire under the name of Quick Bread Editorial. She was previously the acquisitions editor for American Studies and Creative Writing at the University of Georgia Press. She spends a lot of time thinking about new possibilities for how readers might connect with texts. Reinhard Suarez is a writer and editor who has worked in the publishing world since 1999. He has a BA in English and Creative Writing from Loyola University, Chicago, and an MFA from the New School in New York City. Currently, he freelance edits for money, teaches classes at The Loft, and sings lead vocals in a two-man rock band. You can visit his website at theporkchopexpress.com. So, since the dawn of video games as household commonplaces, there's often been a tension between bookish types who would insist that the intellectual and cultural value of print trumps that of video games. However, for those of us who love reading fiction, I'm sure we've all had the experience of an authority figure telling us to put the book down and just go outside. <laughs> or even the annoying idea that reading fiction is a waste of time, that the only thing of value to read is informative nonfiction. And while there always have while there have always been those who have insisted on the intellectual and cultural importance of video games, or at least their potential, in recent years there's been a huge increase in the overall intellectual respect gaming receives. Of course, if economics are any indicator of how important a medium is to the culture, then gaming is way ahead of publishing, as many of us know publishing is not doing that well right now. So, tonight it's not about video games versus books. It's about what those mediums share, what they can learn from each other, and how they can be combined. And for the most part, we'll be talking about kind of narratively driven video games as opposed to things like Tetris, uh, or game or puzzle games, though those might come up as well. 
Um, we'll start by asking, the, I'll ask the panel some discussions, some questions, let them discuss, and then we'll open up the forum to the audience. Um, so to start with, uh, a quote from writer Tom Bissell from a recent article in the UK Guardian, and then a question. Writing and reading allow one consciousness to find and take shelter in another. When the minds of the reader and writer perfectly and inimitably connect, objects, events, and emotions become doubly vivid, more real somehow than real things. I have spent most of my life seeking out these connections and attempting to create my own. Today, however, the pleasures of literary connection seem left over and familiar. Today, the most consistently pleasurable pursuit in my life is playing video games. So, how is the immersive experience panel of reading a story similar to the immersive experience of reading a book, and how is it different? Anyone? Well, I think, I mean, I, I would say that the difference uh, is that the, the, the medium of video games en enables people to tell stories in different ways because you actually, uh, I mean, I think generally people think that it's maybe like a choose your own adventure, but I think that there's ways to tell story in video games when it's done well. And obviously I think um, the video game industry has spent a lot of time of learning and we're just kind of at a, a dawn of a new Aquarius kind of thing going forward where we're getting better at it. But uh, uh, when it's done well, you're able to tell bits and pieces of the story through discovery, through interaction and things of that nature that I, I think are, are unique to the medium and attach people to the experience, it becomes memories. They, they actually have like stories that they tell, that they're stories that they write themselves in Grand Theft Auto. I mean, the, the glory of a, of a sandbox games is not that some script writer came up with something, but it's that a story that you create when you took that car, drove it to the top of the parking ramp, shot it off, hit this helicopter, parachuted down, and landed on this car, and then took off in a Lamborghini. I mean, that's like, that's a story that you created that happened uh, for you, and, and I think that's different. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I basically think the same thing where um, the, the player, player of a game can be seen like a reader, and, and the act of playing the game is almost sort of mixed or, or, or blended with the act of writing. So yeah, in, in Grand Theft Auto you can create the storyline um, and in games with um, a more robust storyline um, where maybe the main character is a little more defined for you instead of you defining it like in, in a lot of role-playing games. Um, you can sort of sink into the character so that when you, you know, it, the magic really happens when you talk with other people who have also played the game and they'll ask you, well, what did you do? You know, not not... What you know? Do you remember what happened when, you know, so and so did this? They'll ask you, "What did you do?" So, it's 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 really the creation as well as playing through the game. I think to that point, I'll pass you just a second. But you know, that's the I think everyone who played Bioshock, the first thing you asked someone was, "Did you or did you not <laughs> kill the little sisters?" And of course, <laughs> that said something about you. And I will not answer what I. <laughs> Well, I was just reading something in the New York Times that kind of was drawing parallels between dog ownership and playing video games, <laughs> and about how so much of the pleasure comes from the simple act of doing, kind of being there and doing these repetitive tasks, and kind of taking pleasure in the meditation of, of you know, the, the motor skills and the walking and the having to engage, not on a very deep level, but repeatedly over a certain amount of time. And I think that that is a little bit different than the reading experience in a lot of ways. Um, the, it seems like we could think about playing a video game as being both a reader, but what Andy was talking about also kind of puts the player in the role of an author, <clears throat> which like leads me to think a lot about interactivity. I mean, like it's, uh, I mean, I think both video games and reading get accused sometimes of being, well, actually reading more often, <laughs> of being more passive. And I actually don't think that's true because I think you're, the reader himself is, or herself is filling in the virtual world of, of the narrative that they're reading. Um, other people would say that video games are more uh, interactive because you know, you're actually controlling the character. Um, what do you guys think about the kind of the difference in interactivity? Like, is our video games 
uh, more popular because they're interactive, or what's the what's the role of agency in video games and books? I think part of it is that um, you know when when you're experiencing book, uh, you are experiencing the story of a character most most of the time um, and in a video game usually it's from a perspective you know when it's not fully first person you know like an, an FPS a first person shooter um, even if you're on the screen as a third person like you see your little figure you're still inhabiting the character in a way that you're not doing as a reader you are actually the character. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I think that like, I mean, that's the charm of both mediums, right? I mean, I think I think video games just, just take just as much imagination as a book, right? I think there's always you're always filling it a little bit. I mean, some of the animations you see in some of these games are so bad. If you're not using your imagination, <laughs> uh, you know, it would it would be appalling, and you'd walk away. But um, I, I think what's 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 kind of interesting about about the two is that. Um, like in a scary book, when you read it, you know what I mean. Like I think you feel like appalled. Do you know what I mean? There's a sense of like you can like kind of get loneliness and the things that come from a book. But only in Resident Evil can that dog come out of that cabinet <laughs> and really just like make you jump and or scream. I mean, I have done the Flanders from the basement many times. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, during you know Dead Space and things like that. I think that's a that's a different emotion that it, that it plays to. It, it has more of that thrill ride. I mean, I think. You know, Call of Duty, um, and, and actually the guys who made Call of Duty even started this with Medal of Honor, is that they said, hey, how do we make a roller coaster ride? And, and in theory, some of these games are basically haunted houses. You know, you can go back and say Disney was doing this 50 years ago. So, I mean, it's, it's an entertainment thing that people have loved since the dawn of time. It's just now we're doing it interactively. Now we're able to take part in that, and we're able to go through the haunted house on our TV screens, right? You know, for now, and so I think that um, that experience, that roller coaster ride, is a different thrill, um, and that's one of those things that video games, I think, are trying to, to to get across that gap. Is how do we make gaming more intellectual? How do we make it get to those emotions that a book could get? I mean, there's just there's there, they both have reactions that they each hold individually, and people are always trying to get like. You know, movies. You know, do the same thing. Anytime it's an entertainment medium, they're trying to find ways to do that, and so um, I think that's that's what they kind of hold to their own. Well, I think when you're reading a book, you you kind of build a picture of what the characters are, are, what they look like, and what they're doing, and you're kind of experiencing the story through these characters that you build. But then there's the added aspect that you never experience a book the same way twice. You you read it at different points in, in your life. And you learn different things, and you have a different experience of that text every time you read it. And the same, I think, sounds like it's 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 true with video games. You you have a different experience every time you play it, and I think that kind of variability um, is is very translatable. I'm wondering about um, you know we're talking about the actual experience of playing the games and of reading, uh, but so. What happens after? Like, if you if you experience a really good narrative story in a video game, and if you read a really good novel, are you is the memory of that experience different, or uh, is it you know I don't know about better, but like how how is the memory different? Like, if you could open up someone's brain after they experienced it, could they tell the difference between a video game memory and a, a book memory? I don't know. I mean, when I read a novel, I kind of work through it for a couple of days after I've read it, and, and not even just a couple of days. Sometimes it's months and years, and um, and so in 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 that way, I'm kind of always processing what I've just done or what I've learned and what I've been through. But I think with a video game, the actual action, like the 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 fact that you've played a role and how the story unfolds. Um, has a little bit, maybe it creates a, a little bit of a different kind of experience in, in the working through afterwards. I don't know if maybe you strategize a little bit more about how you could do it better next time or um, you know what could be different. But I, I feel like there's a nuance there, but I don't really know how to, how to put that, maybe. Yeah, I would say one of the things that would be you know, feeling different. I, I think it's interesting when you ask someone about a video game, like, you know, you know, hey, dude, you were playing that last night, what'd you think? 
I think video games, when people discuss them initially, they talk about it like they would a car. Like, ah, the seat's a little uncomfortable, steering radius isn't enough. You know, I mean, there's a lot of, like, technical issues that I think that come up when you when you talk about a game at the beginning. And I think that um, that's one of the problems with games is that it's it's often looked at as, like, this these kind of consumer reports as opposed to, like, how did it make you feel? Sure, you can read a book that was poorly written. I mean, we've all seen that. Uh, but, I mean, usually, if you connect with the writer and what they've written and the story that they're telling, uh, you're talking more about what the story happened and, and how it advanced and what, what, what the discussion pieces are. Um, games are less likely to do that. Um, like a game like Tetris will never do that. You won't be like, oh man, I really hated the music. I guess would be all you could really say. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and that's a brilliant game, and Pac Man's a brilliant game, and games in their simplicity are really, truly brilliant. But um, I think that's where, where gaming is going now, and I think that's really interesting that gaming is starting to push into. Instead of people sitting around and talking about that, that they're talking about where the story took them, how the story made them feel, and I think those are new emotions in games. I mean, I, I think, sure, there's stories from like Zork in the early days in the 70s, but that I think we've matured in our ability to, to, to match that interactivity to the storytelling as far as, well, I guess not me, but people who make games and are smarter than me. I think um, one of the cool things about remembering a story, you know, in, in retrospect is that um, it's always couched in the context in which you experienced it. So I think books have done this for hundreds of years and, you know, they, they, they can just draw you into that story and, you know, you're, you're there with the characters. And I think that video games, by and large, I mean, really, as far as their narrative storytelling, a lot of them don't do that, like Andy was saying, Tetris or, you know, even Mario Brothers, you, you remember not being able to make the pit in 8.3 and you wanted to kill someone. But um, in, in, those ex in those rare games, and I don't really want to call them rare, but in, in relatively few games that have a very strong, uh, very cohesive narrative, I think the experience in pa you know, past the mechanics of whether you have a controller or whether you're you know, sitting on your porch with a book, is the same because you know if it hits you emotionally if the characters hit you emotionally you're going to feel as much passion for those characters you know whether it's in a book or whether you know you, you see it on the computer screen or your TV you know like in a movie um, you know there are there are movies that really hit you very emotionally as much as a book can so it seems uh, I'm thinking about um, narration like it I, it seems to me that video games are always first person. I mean, you're always the kind of acting agent as a, as a player. I I wanted well, a is that true? But I think it's one thing that you could get from a, like a first person voice in fiction, which maybe you can't necessarily in a video game as a voice. You're kind of entering in the head of the way the the, uh, the narrator thinks, and which is different because you're. In the video game, you're kind of creating that, and voice, it's not a good analogy, I don't think, but it's, are there examples of third-person narration, or is everything first-person? Is it always you? Well, I think memories generally come to you from a video game as being first-person, but I think games do are created in third, I mean, there are games in third-person. I mean, like, when you play an old-school classic uh, Leisure Suit Larry you know, like choose your own adventure. You know, no one sits around and says, "I am Leisure Suit Larry." You know what I mean? Like, but you go like, "What dumb things can I make Leisure Suit Larry do?" Right? You know, and that and that's like the fun and like where like the the charm of those games come from. And there's a story and it's very linear and there's only one solution. You have to find the key. You have to put it in the door. Um, but it's the solution and it's the hilarity that comes from watching the dumb things that you make this person do. Uh, that the hilarity comes from. Seaman is another game where. Seaman was, uh, it was Leonard Nimoy, was basically this weird creature that lived in your TV and mocked you. Uh, uh, he made fun of everything you did in your life, and you gave him voice commands, and then he died. Uh, <laughs> it, it was a really weird experience, but I mean, it was something where you were interacting with something else. I think you could say, uh, like, the virtual pets would be something where, you know, it's not like you necessarily there. So there are, there are instances of it, but I think that's one of the interesting things you bring up, is that we all view them as like weirdly us 
being involved yeah. with that. I mean, I think I think that that attachment is something that comes from it. But I, I will say this: I think attachment in games, and I think just like attachment in books and attachment in entertainment in general, comes from familiarity and spending time with it. I mean, no one spends five hours doing something they think is dumb, right? Uh, so like after some point you have committed to it mentally to say I think Seaman is cool It's Leonard Nimoy screaming at you and dying, <laughs> right? But but you convince yourself that's a good thing and and that's that's like good entertainment convinces lots of people that that's a good thing and they enjoy it Sorry no, I, I think being able to control a character's destiny or something like that is a, is a really attractive component of, of playing video games wow. You know there are there are a few novels that you read where you think, why did that character do that? Or I would have done that if I had actually been that person in that situation. And, you know, with a video game, you, you have the chance to kind of go back and revisit these decisions and figure out what would have worked, what didn't work, and, and, and how that all works. But with the text, sometimes you, you don't have that much flexibility, but there is flexibility in other ways. So. Yeah, I totally. I mean, like, that's, uh, isn't that like, I mean, they're, they're kind of cathartic. I mean, that's why... I mean, everyone said video games was killing everyone in the world, and that's why we were shooting each other. And the fact of the matter is, is that it was just people at home going, "God, my boss sucks," and like shooting him up and getting it out of the way before they blew up a post office. You know, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I think that that helps, you know, get people through that they they, they create relationships and, and and get things out. Uh, I, as far as POV. Um, whether it's first person or third person, I, I think Andy's right, where because you're controlling some aspect of the game, you always end up remembering it as a first person experience. Um, I think there are a couple of games that are kind of blur that line, like um, Bastion actually has a narrator oh, yeah. that That's tells you, yeah. what's going, you know, what's happening to you. Or, or um, Do you see the narrator? Or is it a voice? It's a voice. It's a, it's a voiceover. Okay. And uh, or, or Dragon Age Two, which is has uh, an interesting framework of a story being told, a, a legend being told, and you sort of play out these little story bits. Um, so I, I mean, I think again, like I I, I don't want to like lock into say most games, but a great number of games sort of default to first person, but there are occasions when it's not so. Um, it seems. If, uh, we're talking about narration. It, it, it seems to me that one advantage a novel might have over video games, and I don't, I'm not a video game expert, so probably there are examples otherwise that in a novel and in a movie, you can the the creator can jump time, like you can you can fl flashback, flash forward, like the, the t but that in a lot of video games, time is necessarily chronological. Um, I mean, unless you're positing. Uh, space travel or time travel or something in the narration, but it's, I mean, I don't want to say advantage, but is there an example of jumping around in time in video games like you can in a book? Yeah. Yeah, there's been plenty of flashbacks in there. Actually, I, I find the flashback Assassin's Creed, I think Call of Duty has even done some too, which I, I think it's weird that I think that one did it, but I know Assassin's Creed did. Where you How does go that work? Basically, uh, in Assassin's Creed, Desmond is, he's connected to this device that lets him relive memories from his ancestors, right? So it's like genetic memories that he that he's going through. So is he acting then in those or are you just seeing them? What well, well he is in a, I mean he's in a device. Like the UI that you look through is you being kind of like stuck in this machine and then it's like you ready to go? Here we go. And then all of a sudden you like kind of phase into Italy, you know, the Middle East. I mean, that, like that, that's, the, uh, that's the brilliance of the series is that it lets you travel around the world through these genetic memories. And, and what happens is, is you're reliving the game through this memory, but they've even had like, I mean, to get like all meta, but they've had memories within the memories that you kind of go back through to kind of find and solve puzzles. And in that game, uh, you know, I, I'm actually a, a, um, Patrice, um, who, who started the series for Assassin's Creed, and Corey May, who holds up the, uh, the writing of the series now, they've done an amazing job of working in reality uh, into these games as well. So it's like complete fiction, but at the same time, too, you go to um, you know a famous place in in, uh, in Italy, and you're there, and it looks very real, and it's in 3D, and you're, you're kind of mesmerized by it, and it has these secrets that you find. And it'll be like, I mean, this is one that was like, blew my mind. It was like, Hey, yeah, this whole thing where this orb, which is fictional in the game, had it was in touch with Henry Ford, and like, and basically came back to like 
that Henry Ford hated Jews, which I was like, wait, what? Like, I totally missed that. Like, I wasn't watching enough Discovery or whatever, and I was like, you go online, you look it up, and you're like, oh my God, like, Henry Ford was just not who I remembered him as being. And, and I learned that through a video game. And so there are clever ways that you can use flashback, discovery, I mean, all these things that you can use and devices that you can use in other ways to learn. As I mentioned yesterday when we kind of pre-talked was The Secret World. It's a new game where they want you to solve puzzles in an MMO. And, and the idea is that the answer to it, they don't want you to like find it in the game. They want you to find it on a, a wiki somewhere. I mean, they want you to use a browser in-game, go out, look in the real world and find the solution. Use your Google skills and bring it back and use it into the game. And I think that's ways that you can you can use that to solve things. And uh, I think, I, I mentioned before, I think it'd be really cool if there were like murder mystery novels that you were reading and you were like, hey, I'm Miss Marvel. I'm going to get in there and figure out, you know, what I can do to help solve this mystery. And then it helps lead me to things that I can do and become a part of, of, of the story. I want Junior to have her in the video. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> I think a really uh, a very meta um, sort of example of this is uh, it's an older uh, Sierra online game, Space Quest 4, where you go backward and forward, sort of in time. You actually travel to future games in the series. Like you go, you know, you travel forward to Space Quest 14, and you have to figure out what the heck is going on and what you, as Roger Wilco, have done between Space Quest 4 and 14. And then you travel back to Space Quest 1, and you see yourself, and all the graphics change to like EGA, and there's a text parser, and, and like, you know, so that there are ways, I mean, just as much as in movies can go backward and forward in time, and even sideways in time, um, I, I think games can and, and have done that. Um, so, books have been made into movies for years. Um, and over the past decade, there's some examples of video games being made into both movies and books. Um, and of course, there are examples of movies being made into video games. Um, what are the challenges of transferring the story back and forth to and from video games? And what are kind of the opportunities or advantages? Um, I mean, the history of um, the history of sort of adapting video game or adapting story or video games to movies and movies to video games hasn't really been a pretty one. Um, anyone who knows the, you know, sort of uh, the movies of Uwe Boll, um, uh, director of such luminous, amazing things as Doom and Alone in the Dark, starring Christian Slater. Um, I, I, I can't, I don't know why these movies stink. Um, because especially when some of the games that they come from actually have pretty cool stories. And, you know, one would wonder why they didn't just move the story to the screen. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, that's some weird inside of that. I mean, generally, the, the, the actual license is kind of sold off to Hollywood, mm -hmm. and they actually request in a typical Hollywood fashion, like, oh no, you're video game people, you're idiots. <laughs> you have no idea what making a movie is, and we'll make this movie and make it great. Back off. You know, you don't know anything about this thing you've spent your entire life like you know, being crazy about. So um, it's rare that, that the actual group that came up with the concept gets to, to stay through and get to see something through to the end. They usually kind of pawn it off and take the cash. So it, it's uh, video game movies have been doomed because no one ultimately cares. We're like George R. R. Martin's like, hey, you want to make you want to make uh, Game of Thrones? Sure, make me executive producer. I'm going to sit on here. I'm going to make sure this goes the way I want it to go. He's involved with casting. He's involved with all these all these parts as he moves up into being involved with this. The video game guy who's super involved with it steps back and lets someone else take care of it. I actually think that Game of Thrones is better in the series than it was in the in the books. Um, and I think that that worked really well. And, and part of the problem, I think, with turning video games into movies may actually be that there's a question of translation, like the experiential, that's not easily transmittable to the big screen. I don't know. Maybe it's, you just need to be involved in part of the stories, seeing how things develop. I know that when I read fiction and then see a movie, I'm 
often, it's, it's rare that I'm really pleased with how it turns out. You know, I've pictured the characters a certain way, I've pictured the settings a certain way, and if they don't match what I think is, is right, then I, it's hard for me to forget that. So I, I just, I think it's a question of translation kind of in many different ways. What about movies into games? Because that, are there, I mean, there, I imagine there's plenty of unsuccessful <laughs> versions. I mean, it's, it's like you can't, with a movie, you're, you know, you're being led, you're, everything's being done to you. Like you're seeing that, but how can you turn that into an interactive experience, or is it just a bad translation, or is it just a gimmick? I would like to bounce this over to the critic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm dying for this question. Uh, I mean, it's. I mean, th this is one of those money eats the world questions. In that, uh, you know, a game can only cost forty, fifty million dollars when you have to give the movie studio or the video or the comic or whatever ten million of it to make the license. Then the publisher has to be very committed to what they invest. Uh, to, to push it forward. I mean, I think that's one of those things where you would say to yourself, oh, Lucas Arts would be brilliant because they already have the license, they could do what they want, they could make great games, nothing can be further from the truth. Um, they have made a disaster of that. Um, there's too many license holders. You, you can't, anything that would make a cool video game idea, I mean, I've talked to guys who do this and they're like, like, hey, why didn't you do this? And they're like, yeah, because I didn't think of that. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> they thought of that. Yeah, they, they're not idiots. Yeah. They wanted to put that in the game. But there are so many stakeholders involved, it becomes very, very, very difficult. I think it's once again, it's it's a it's 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 the vision and how do we get it across and how do we get someone who really cares about the vision? Because I mean, just like anyone who's pushed a book, a novel, anything, someone has to convince someone to give you money <laughs> to make that amazing thing, right? Like if, if that's what you want to do, you have to push it through, and so. Um, it becomes very difficult when, like at, at like EA, when they go, yeah, you're making this bad, ben, you know, Simpsons game. You go, great, you know, and everyone on the team can follow through with that enthusiasm, and that typically is unfortunately what happens. Sorry, <laughs> I I think going going from movies to games, I, I wonder how much like certain production schedule things have to do with um, how the games turn out. You know, for example. You know, does a game, does the schedule get compressed to sort of be released close to the premiere date, for example? Or, or the DVD release. Or the DVD I mean, yeah, release, yeah, yeah, you, know, all, yeah. you know? And, and I, I think also there could be, you know, translation issues where, you know, you, for example, Thor, right? I mean, Thor essentially in a video game would be a dude running around hitting things with a hammer. Um, and, like, you could make that interesting, I guess, but... I mean, how much does it have to adhere to the movie? You know, how, what do you do when, like, in, in, you know, how do you emulate the, the romantic parts with Natalie Portman? Uh, you know, <laughs> so the, I think there are sort of those concerns. There are storytelling concerns that, you know, like, what do you, how do you emulate that in a game? And that's it. There's people that, there are people that do do good ones. You know what I mean? Like, there are good examples of but they, like, it seems games. Like they might not necessarily be good because they're related to the movie at all. They're just good games. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, that's what I tend to think. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I thought I thought Riddick was great. Uh, I, I was a big fan of Riddick. I thought Starbreeze, Starbreeze cared. Uh, they did a lot of great stuff with it. Was someone else screaming out out there? Yeah. Riddick was awesome. Goldeneye? Goldeneye would be great. Which one was that? Or did you say, did you say Riddick was great? Really the Riddick game is great. Like, the Riddick game is actually... Well, Pitch Black is good, but it's better than any of the sequels that come to the movie. Like, there's, there's, there's no doubt about that. I mean, there. I mean, that's the thing is, you know, just like anything, I, I think passion defines so many of the things. I mean, I know from from Game Informer, one of the things we do is, you know, we go talk to developers and we're trying to figure out what they're doing. We look at games really early on and we're trying to figure out whether they're good or not. And like, you can see from the team that's working on it, like, you can almost see how good a game is going to be by how much they know and how much they care about their games. Um, the passion that trips from people that really want to make something great is really, really obvious. It, I, I think it's something that you can see from a mile away, and you can have someone come in and they can start, you know, they need, like, I think our game is about, oh yeah, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, and you're like, oh god, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> you know, if he doesn't know who stars in his game, this is not going to work. Um, so I think that 
Um, you know, passion plays a big part. I think it's unfortunate that a lot of big teams will just say no. You gotta remember too, if you're really good at video games, you're gonna be like, I don't wanna write this, you know? Uh, I, I think like Transformers, by the way, would be another example of a game that's been pretty good based on a license. But uh, it, it happens, things fall apart, but there's games that are original IP that are, that are disasters too, just like there's a, you know, books that are disasters. I mean, there's plenty of disasters in the world today. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, as more uh, women play video games, is that, has that been changing like the offerings or like the stories that get told in a lot of the video games? Or is that, like, what is that? I, I don't know what within the gaming industry, like you, the perception from outside is that it's always, you know, dudes. But then you hear things like, oh, it's 47% are women, and then other people say, yeah, well, that counts solitaire. Like, is, is the video, I, was, I read that today somewhere. Um, but the, is, as women have started to do more gaming, is that changing the stories? Well, I, I think so. I mean, I think Amy Amy Henning at uh, at Naughty Dog is amazing. I think she's super talented. She worked at Crystal Dynamics back in the day. She worked on Legacy of Kane, Soul Reaver. She's been in the industry forever. She's brilliant. I think the best dialogue that's ever been in a video game is Uncharted, the Uncharted series. I mean, say what you will about the aiming system. Uh, uh, the uh, I mean the writing in that game is brilliant. I mean there's times like I I was like you know Nathan and Elena are talking and like they say a joke to each other and I was like that was really cute. You know what I mean like I don't <laughs> there's not a lot of games that I would say that about and and, and you know is is it all Amy's fault? Amy would say no, it's not. She would say she has a great team that makes great games and they all really work together and that's where that kind of magic comes from. But I think she's someone who cares about character. She cares about what those people do. She cares about what they say. Um, and I think that, 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 that her passion for what people do in games and their story in games translates to their games. Um, inevitably, people that make games with good stories are people that care about good stories in games. Um, there are so many games made where they're like, well, yeah, we got a guy, maybe we, uh, with these birds, they're angry. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, maybe we'll have some angst, and then uh, and then we'll blow some things up, and, and like that's their story. Um, whereas other people, like Kim Levine at, at uh, Irrational, I mean, like the, the team at Irrational kind of gets mad, I think, at Ken because he spends so much time trying to come up with the best possible, most interesting way to approach everything. And I think, you know, eventually people are like, can we just make the game now? Like, we're, you know, kind of sitting around. I don't know if you saw the South Park special where, like, Trey and Matt are sitting in that room working on the episode's ideas and everyone are walking by, like, when are we going to start working? <laughs> uh, I, I think that happens there. And I, but I think that's people who care about story make good story. And I think that, that's, that's really, really, really uh, important. And so as far as women gamers... I think that number's gone up you know, significantly. It's, it's the best news ever that the gaming continues to grow and become a bigger part. Yeah, I think video game development still is a great boys club overall, probably, unfortunately, but that's changing every day as well. And sometimes the games that we make, by the way, or that we make, that, that the industry makes, are, are determined by marketing. I mean, we gotta remember that sometimes it's not the, the talent, at least in big games, you know, AAA development, in indie development, Anybody can do anything and really make something interesting, but in big market gaming, there's there is a marketing department determining whether this game is valid or not. Just commercial related to that is that that's similar to independent publishing. Is that of course at big houses, marketing determines whether or not a book is going to get published. But at an independent publisher like Coffee House, it's editorial driven, and we're very writerly focused, and we publish the book because it's good, not because it's going to make a lot of money. We hope it makes money, but. Um, whether or not, you know, I, I think overall, yes, uh, women in, at least in visibility, women in gaming has increased, but I, I think that they've been there all along, and um, I, I don't know how much, I don't know how much that would affect, like, actually what types of games are being made, because, you know, I mean, uh, I, I think, you know, a guy is just as much... Uh, likely to like blowing things up as a girl, you know, when in game, you know, I, I've talked to many friends, uh, female friends who they play Call of Duty or whatever, and they like to blow stuff up. So um, I think there's a danger 
if publishers, game publishers, get in their heads that oh, okay, they're you know it's the same marketing dilemma. Oh, there are more women playing games. We should create games for women because then you might. I mean, what does that really mean? Yeah, it's a disaster, right? Just to point out, I remember when I first started reviewing games, we used to go, oh, this game's really bad, but, like, I think it's for kids. And then someone wrote me a letter, and they're like, why do you hate kids so much? <laughs> and I was like, it's totally right. Like, I do hate children. What am I doing? So, <laughs> I, I think it's the same thing. Like, if you if you say, like, oh, well, this game's for girls, you're doing the same thing. You're, 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 you're damning them to some horrible game. Like, good games are liked by people with brains. Right? And, and that's how it works. Yeah! Yeah, uh, and I just want to say, like, um, you know, I, I don't know if anyone else has played the Barbie game for the, the, the 8-bit Nintendo, but nobody wants to play that game. <laughs> As much as chick, we, I injected chiclet, and um, the term <laughs> or the, the, the candy. phenomenon. So the, yeah, candy. The, the idea is that, that, that this special, like super specialized genre, has to exist because women aren't interested in anything else. Women want to make things blow up. They do. But I think that one of the things that um, <laughs> one of the things that um, that may be changing because women are becoming more visible in games is like the dialogue about games and the dialogue about gender within the games and 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 I think maybe that's that's kind of a big side effect of women, women becoming more like visible. I think a lot of the voice recognition software has also made women more visible in a way. There have been a lot of articles lately about how women have become targets, you know, for all kinds of like terrible taunts and, and harassment uh, because somehow like being more visible is, is... You threaten them? Yeah, yeah. Is um, thinking about character and if like you're uh, a woman, a female gamer, uh, and the narrator of the game, or the active person in the game, is a, a male. Like, is like, how does that? Maybe this should open up to the audience too. And we can start with that. Like, is that does having to play the game as a male affect like, your your experience of the game if they don't offer you an option to be a, have a female avatar? You really want to go there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't get just my thing. <laughs> I, 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 I will field it gingerly. Uh, I would say that you know, you know, I think once you immerse into a character, just like in a film or in a book, I, you know, I don't, I ultimately don't think that matters. The only like, like kind of like thing that I ever thought was kind of cute in that regard was that Laura Croft was originally a dude, but the guy who had to spend hours upon hours looking at his butt while he worked on the game <laughs> just changed it to a girl so he didn't have to look at a dude's butt all the time. <laughs> you know, I, like, I, I don't think ultimately it, it, it matters. You know what I mean? Like a good game will, will attract you kind of either way. Uh, it, it's, it's one of those things that if, um, if, you, if you can't if you don't buy the fantasy, you don't buy the fantasy, whether it's girl, guy, dog, whatever. Huh. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. No what? No, I know. I would say that I will still play a game that only has a guy that I can play as, but I will feel animosity, more animosity <laughs> towards the company. If they're not offered, if standard white people is all I can play, I'm going to think that they're not thinking about me as part of their audience. I'm going to think that they don't want to encourage their male gamers to try what it's like to play as a female, as a person of color. I'm totally going to feel alienated to a certain extent. I may still get drawn in, but my replay value on my game is going to go down. So I do choose to play games based on whether or not I can be um, not just standard white like gamers, but only to be white. I've never made a male character. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems to be. Yeah, I mean, I think all females, all females all the time. Like MMOs are full of dudes who are girls. <laughs> I, I, I know, and making a character to identify with as a woman going to a game, there is a difference. 
I, I agree with you. There's a difference, and I, I think I, I would. You know, most game developers I speak to, they actually would love to be able to do that. The problem is, is that in, if you build a complex like model of like how these people move around and the way that they interact with things, it actually I know this sounds really silly. It gets really expensive to do multiple characters because of the way they have to interact with the world. Like if they have different heights. Like you'll see, like a lot of times they'll be like, "Wow, they, everyone's the same height in this room." You know what I mean? They, they, they use tricks like that to work around some of the technical limitations they have. Um, and that they have to invest in those things. I agree with you. I mean, every year, I mean, like, how many half-shaven, bald head, white, marine, military dudes can there be in the world, right? <laughs> there are a million of them in video games. Uh, there is no doubt about that. It's somewhat frustrating. I and mean, it's frustrating as, like, a white dude, right? Like, it's annoying to see them all the time. I can't imagine your frustration with that. Uh, but I mean, like, I generally try to, like, look around that. I mean, I, I, I definitely agree with you. I wish there was more variety. I mean, I think, I think everyone can look at a game and say this game could have more options, but I think they are generally trying to do right. their best, right? I think the stakes are different for someone who's from a group that is typically recognized, and they're really different for someone who has been on the outside. Oh, I... Like, me playing as a woman of color when I'm not, that's a different experience than a woman of color getting to play as... These are similar issues. I mean, literature deals with these issues as well, and I think it's a, a lot of art forms, a lot of narration does. Um, it's, you know, I don't know. You can blame marketing, I always like to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought maybe, maybe we could open up the floor for some questions. I have a hard time seeing people, but I can try to point and you guys can work it out. So. The questions from the audience, right yeah. there. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. I'll stand up. I really have enjoyed the conversation about agency in games and like the first person versus third person and like how do you experience the game? Well, my my problem is that my experience of video games doesn't go beyond the NES. Beyond what? The NES. Ooh. I I I. Good choice. Played, I know, but I've played and not beaten Mario 1 and 3, and it's just fucking baited my life. <laughs> <laughs> I own the NES, and someday I'll do it. Someday I'll do it. But the point is, I really enjoy watching video games. So my experience of video games is very second person. You're doing this, and I'm watching you do this, and I'm watching you beat this bad guy. So my question, I guess, is. All this question of agency. I have zero agency in video games, and yet I really enjoy it. I really love video games. My first experience of watching someone play a video game was watching my best friend compete on Kingdom Hearts when I was high school. I was just enthralled, and I loved it. And I, I purchased video games just so people would beat them. And I bought them. I'm not, I'm not even kidding. I bought video games for people to beat them for Because I can't do it. I mean, maybe I'm lazy, maybe I'm psyched like, out. I don't But I just, so what is my, what is my experience as a video game? Is it, is it lesser than a first or third person experience? Is it, I don't know. It's like having someone read me a book, except not. But it, it's, it's, it's half that and half like watching the Olympics, right? Like I can't, yeah. like you know, I can't do the pole vault or whatever. But watching <laughs> someone do it is cool, right? You know. So I think there's some of that in there as well. I know where you, Eric, are you, did, we were both, Eric and I were both reading the um, Reality Is Broken by Jane McGonigal, mm -hmm. and I think one did you get to the part yet where she talks about watching? No. Okay, well, I mean, she talks about there's a certain like pleasure, pleasure that she identifies like your your experience. It's almost like, uh, but from her point of view, it was like she'd already mastered the game, and so she was watching someone or helping them. And that's different. That's the opposite oh, of what's actually. <clears throat> but that, there's, a, there's a pleasure in seeing other people yes. accomplish something. Yeah, I I think that there are, that actually is really common. Like uh, when I was a teenager, I was playing Gabriel Knight two. And um, my mom comes in, and she just starts watching, and I'm just like, la la la, it's my mom. And and after that, and then you know, I shut down, and I, I go outside, do whatever. Next day, my mom comes up to me, and she says, "Could you play that game again?" <laughs> and so I think, I mean, uh, part of it, like with with a game that has a store, like a really strong narrative, you're in the narrative, like, you are experiencing it like you're reading a book. 
I think when you know, like you're watching Mario, you know, Mario Three, you should. There's a two whistle trick that you can do. Warp zones. Once I've done that, I can't be eight. Oh God, I'm sorry. I know, I'm um, you might want to watch The Wizard. It, it kind of shows you how to do it. <laughs> But I think it's also it's also being there with that person and like have, you know feeling the tension in the room and like that visceral you know the, the visceral experience of being there. At least that's my guess for for less narrative games. So this is why I like cutscenes. Yeah. No, me too. And and I I like to watch people play video games. I I think it's interesting and. And the cutscenes are kind of a way for me to feel like I'm I'm kind of there too, and and it gives it gives the the actual playing part a little bit more. I uh, feel a little bit more invested as a result. I don't know how people generally feel about cutscenes. Mix cutscenes, maybe. <laughs> I like them. Uh, yeah. It, it seems like it's also. It, uh, it turns the gaming into a communal experience. As yeah. opposed to like books, can you're. I, can I throw out a kind of question? Sure, go ahead. I, I feel like, um, especially back to this center, I feel like sandbox games can be better with a lot of center and community because they provide you to an endeavor situation. Like, uh, it, it depends on the sandbox game, like Minecraft. I know Minecraft requires uh, email uh, cores of the location and playgrounds. <laughs> you like this guy. Well, the complexity of the... I mean, when they, when they make complex characters, I mean, the video game industry makes complex characters, yeah. right? People react, right? Because yeah. humans have flaws. No, no one is Super Mario. Like, no one's just this plumber who can jump all the time, right? Like, <laughs> like, like it, 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 it's a reflection of you or, you know, like, of, of who you are, perhaps. So, yeah. It seems like that's pointing out to that both in video games and books, well, and any kind of narrative, that it's... Well, we kept coming back to this last night. Like, well, well done characters, well done stories, well done texture, scene atmosphere are uh, what make good things. You know, it's not necessarily inevitable to like a video game level. And it's not by accident. Right. Yeah. So you guys. So oh, I meant. Well. Oh, so there's a, a in the book. Well, they're not necessarily resolution, but there's right. the end of the print. You have last page. The end of the print, right? With a video game, you have the opportunity to say, as I go through this process, every step I take can influence how this story ends. Right? So, I befriend someone, or I don't, or whatever it is, right? And, and I know I'm, I'm going to read my books, too, Sam. I feel a little weird with all that stuff. I haven't played it, but I understand that. That has that kind of aspect to it. So, I guess I'm asking from a literature perspective, how do you write a story that has basically 360 degrees of any type of thing, anywhere, right? Um, and all of that depends on things that I do along the way. Right? And, and to me, that's what builds the character. You, as a player, you build that character. You determine how that story ends. 
Yeah, player investment is incredibly amazing when that is done. Like when, when you talk about like any choice you can make is done, or at least the illusion of any choice that you can make is done. I mean, ultimately, Mass Effect, or all its brilliance, really is a choose-your-own-adventure novel where they choose what you can choose, and then they choose what they will remind you that you chose. Um, and so, um, and, and games like Heavy Rain, actually another game, if you really want to get into narrative, it's a really interesting title for PlayStation 3 uh, by David Cage, and he has another game coming up coming up called Beyond. And don't get me wrong, I, actually I would probably say Cage is, he's a little crazy, his story, you could make fun of at times, there's big holes in it, there's a, there's a scene at the end that, like, oh god, video game boards love to make fun of. Um, uh, it, but, you know, they, the illusion of choice is, I think, what everyone who wants to tell a story in a video game wants to do. I mean, I think you're talking about the holy grail of what every single video game developer out there wants to do. And I think that video game guys that I know that write stories now, they think along the same lines of what you're speaking of. They just have to figure out to get there. Uh, we talked a little about this yesterday, is that a lot of times at a lot of video game companies, like they go like, oh, the story guy is still in the room. Uh, didn't even notice. Like, you know, that, that, he, that what he does is not considered at the same level as the like graphic fidelity, how much the control, what how many multiplayer modes do we have, how much is like him and the sound guy are like ostracized to the corner and get to do their stuff at the end and please don't annoy me very much. Um, they have to assert themselves. They have to become important to the team. They have to become important to what's going forward. And when that happens, that's when we'll start to see a shift of games doing more and more of what you're talking about that really care about the narrative and creating choice that matters. Okay. Yeah. Does, does I mean, the soundtrack guy or the program? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I know. I'm just trying to. <laughs> but that is the key. How do you. Well, who writes those? I mean, I'm not, I'm not a writer. Right? So, who gets a story that has 360 degrees of and I, I think that, you know, I think mm -hmm. that, like, Daisy in Minecraft, if you watch the videos, you can explain that. That's the version of storytelling, and that's where they shut the end up and just create the machine that they release. So, that's just your character. You do what you want, if you die, you will be made. It's a very cool effect, that. But that's how it's just a story, and that's the essence of what's fun. Emergent stories will always be crazy, but there will still be narrative-driven story that will change. You know what I mean? Yeah. You are correct. The emergent stories are crazy, insane, and daisies, and watch YouTube. It's weird. It's crazy. Erica. Well, from the from the point of view of literature, though, I I, I want to argue that some of the best literature, some of my favorite literature, um, doesn't really have 360 degrees of, of ending. You know, the the, the printed page. You know, you may come to the end of the book. But say you read um, Gino Diaz's The Brief on Earth's Life of Oscar Lowe, you feel like, you know, Oscar Lowe is somehow like accompanying you for, you know, days, weeks, maybe months after you've read that book. And the book isn't so much um, an ending or a stone of narrative as it is kind of like the beginning of a larger story, it, it, it felt like to me anyway. And so, so I would argue that the literature actually has a little bit more possibility there. Um, and I think actually the Wizard of Oz books, uh, they're all public domain. What's not public domain, I guess, is the Ruby Slippers. But the uh, L. Frank Baum estate actually encourages and sanctions people writing, I mean, it's fan fiction essentially. But I mean, outside of the, the realm of the single book that's done, like you, nothing in fact is stopping you from writing or imagining or, or creating a movie based on that book. Like you can do it. You might not be able to sell it, but you can still do it. <laughs> uh, I think what's interesting about that question is that when you look at the process of writing itself, you could you could say that as a writer writes, he evaluates all the possibilities at any given moment in the storyline. So if a character, you know, if Sherlock Holmes tumbles off the cliff or not. The, the, the writer actually has to evaluate, okay, what would happen if this happens? What would happen if this happens? And it, you know, in, in a novel, the writer decides. Whereas, perhaps in a game like Mass Effect, they do the same process, but instead of just deciding one, they say, oh, we come up with this, these five possibilities. 
So they build all of them out and then give you as a player the option of picking one of them. So it is very much sort of like a magician's, like it's an illusion. The choice is an illusion, but it still gives you the feeling of agency. Yeah. I'm curious about your thoughts on, so having been an English major, you get taught to seek out sort of the hidden secrets in novels, which are akin to Easter eggs in video games. And uh, do you believe that like sort of, or how closely do you think that those two items are related? So searching for Easter eggs in video games, is that enhance your experience? And then searching for uh, hidden meanings in novels, does that enhance your experience in video games? Um, I, I think it does enhance both. I mean, I, in terms of, are you talking about like hidden, e hidden Easter eggs that are just like funny little things like in, um, what was it, Adventure? Yeah. Okay. Like, uh, I think it's cool. It's, it, that gives you a sense of like accomplishment, I think, like when you find one of those. And it's the same thing when you get an illusion in a book. You're like, oh, wow, that's so cool. I, I read that last week. Or, you know, oh, that, or, you know, you come across a name and you're wondering, oh, who is that? You go look it up and you're like, okay, this is how you connect these two texts. I mean, I think there is, that's a way to get some sort of, a sort of interactivity into a book. I mean, I think that the, it depends if, there, if it's done in, to me, in service to the story, as opposed to just to show that the author or the new novel is clever. Okay. Um, yeah. So you guys mentioned Grand Theft Auto as, a, as an example of player agency right off the bat. So I'd love to get your your specific opinions on Grand Theft Auto Three, where you just like sort of nameless, voiceless guy versus Grand Theft Auto Four, where people know it and there's like this story laid out based on their personality and sort of generally what the role of voiceless protagonists like Morgan Freeman, Link, that kind of thing, what their role is in storytelling, and player agency, and gaming in general. I mean, I would say it's a, I would say it's a device in which the, the which the, the team is working with it. I mean, I think that it has its own cases where it's incredibly compelling, right? Um, I, I uh, a friend of mine who worked on Crash Bandicoot. I remember we were like, they spent all this time on stuff, and we were like, well, well why doesn't he just you know, say anything? You know what I mean? Like, well, you know, you know, like Jack and Jack and the Dexter. You're like, I mean, everyone's talking here, but Jack has like this just looks at everybody and like smirks. Like, it's weird. Um, and so I, I think there's times, like they said, they wanted the player to, to use their own voice to deliver you know, what they said. Um, I, I think it just depends on, on who you are and where you are and what you're making. I mean, I think in Grand Theft Auto 3, it was actually kind of brilliant that you are this like kind of nameless, faceless thing. It, it played into making people pay attention to what mattered in that game, and that was the fact that, that game I mean, that game broke major ground in the way that video games are made. I mean, it, it just did. And so no one was was confused by this guy talking or concerned about a guy talking. They were concerned about like, understanding and exploring the world. So, you know, I would say for me, I think Link not talking is now annoying. Like, there was a time when it was cute, but now it's like you need to step up and do, like, a, a really, like, big delivery. But I, I'm not going to the same as everybody else. I read, a, I read an interview with Shigeru where he said that he designed the first game to intentionally immerse the person playing, like you were supposed to be Link. That's why Link didn't say anything, Link had no dialogue anytime you talk to somebody, because you were supposed to be Link. But now it's sort of become this cinematic thing over the year, over the decades, where Link is this person and the story is laid out for you. So I don't know if you have, if you have an opinion about how that sort of has progressed over the years. His first character was a plumber that ate <laughs> mushrooms and got big. <laughs> right. He spends a lot of time in his garden. Yeah. <laughs> so, I see um, someone here on the left uh, has, has his hand up for a while, and then someone way back there. So, first, yeah. I, I love that we're talking about this story, especially that you brought up magic weapons, so that you want to be like, not play yeah, well, I'm going to spoil it. Oh, okay. You don't have to spoil it if you can help it. 
So when I think about storytelling in games, I kind of think about three levels of it. And the, the first level is where the story is just something that happens. It's delivered to you as you play the game. And it doesn't really matter that much to you that part of the game other than to provide a place. If you strip all of the story out of Halo, it would still be a fun game to hand I mean, if you don't play, I'm not saying the story is a bad story or anything, like it's, it's fun, but it, the story gets delivered to you sort of at a different part of your brain than the game you're playing. And then the second level is stuff like Mass Effect, where, and you know, Dragon Age, where you have agency to affect the story, but it's sort of a it, it is a choose your own adventure thing, like you said. Like you are presented with a menu of options, and somebody's like, hey, this crisis is happening, how are we going to tackle it? And you have you know, tackle it in method A and tackle it in method B, and that would have ramifications, but your agency is a point-click decision. And there have been very few scratches of the surface of what I think of the third level, where it's, which is where story is something that is carried with you while you play the game. You give a shit about the story while you're shooting aliens or solving puzzles or something like that. And the only example I can really think about, which I think is most of the illusion was that I got fooled into it, was uh, in Mass Effect 2, at the end you're like assaulting the bad guy's base or whatever, and you have to send a guy to infiltrate an air duct or something, and it has to be a guy that you pick from guys who have a certain skill set. So I said Garrus, and I was like, I was really worried about him. Oh, oh, no, 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 because I was worried Garrus was going to die. So that, this is the example I can come up with where I cared about story during gameplay and story affected me during gameplay. And I'd like to hear what you guys have to say about that. Well, I think that comes down to the fact that you really like that character, which is, I mean, that emotion was in you. Yeah. And so even the thought that, you know, this character, your friend, like your best friend, is in danger, you're like, I, I felt the same thing, yeah. you know, at, uh, it wasn't that moment, but there was another moment in that same game where I was like, he, my friend is in danger, I have to go save him, and at that point, at for that little moment, he wasn't just uh, a, a character in the game, he was like, that's my friend, I have to go get him, so, <laughs> it's because they succeeded in that moment. I, I would like to hear what you guys think about where games are heading to do more of that, to do more of story while you're playing game mechanics as opposed to text that is being thrown at you or being cheap. Uh, once again, success uh, brings more success. Um, success. I mean, the thing is, is right now, is people know that Halo and Call of Duty are very successful. If you make a good multiplayer game, you lose things, you make billions of dollars. Um, once these things are made, people go out and follow suit. Um, Mass Effect uh, was a successful trilogy where they showed what could happen with a trilogy like this. I think even the team that worked on this has said, like, I don't know if I want to do that again. Like, it was tough. You know, it was tough to do in that, in that measure. At the end of Mass Effect 3, for people who don't know, the community actually got extremely angry at them for the end of their story. Uh, they went back and tried to, to kind of fix the ruffled feathers to make that work, but people, as he pointed out, were extremely invested in those characters, and when things did not end the way they wanted them to end, or with the choice they wanted to have, they were mad. Um, so I, I think what's, what happens is we're going to have a next generation of software that's going to come around, or uh, hardware I mean, and then as that comes around, that enables more tools, that gives them more opportunities, and just like anything, the guys who are writing the stories now, they have panels like this at GDC where they say, Dear God, how do we how do we make this happen? How do we make these things change? 
And I think they're learning and exploring, just like the guys who made Pong, you know, never knew it would grow into what it is today. The guys that were writing stories 10 years ago had no clue that they'd be where they are today or where they'll be 10 years from now. It's just going to take, you know, building on the shoulders of giants. So I think uh, we might just have time for one more. And there was that someone in the way back that I said before. And I just wanted to Someone else could talk to the gaming feature of that, but it seems to me that I don't know if it, the parallel in theater or in fiction, I don't know if you would say it attracts from the value. Like, I think if, if that's the intent, a uh, creator of a work can bring you through something that is gruesome or boring or difficult to bear, and some you might say that it actually adds to its artistry rather than detracts from it. You know, not everything, so it depends like entertainment versus art. Even though that's blurry. It then seems like you're asking about the difference between like catharsis and voyeurism, and it's a really it's a really difficult question. Yeah, I mean it's a bad idea if you want to like sell make a lot of money like you're doing like a Transformers movie. But you know, if someone made the Hurt Locker and it's awesome, right? You know, so like there are places, there are things that some people can't watch or can't bear, and uh, Sometimes that's what makes it interesting. We'll do one more. Um, right? Yeah. Could you talk a bit about the difference in the intention of the game? Because to me, it seems like the main point of the book is to tell a story. But the main point of the game is to create the user experience. So the story, by necessity, should not be the primary thing in the game. Like, I can play Mass Effect, it's got a good story. But I don't play it for the story, I play it because I like the experience. So if the story of Mass Effect isn't going to be the great Gatsby, it shouldn't be, because if, if they try to do that, it's going to be a great game. Whereas with the great Gatsby, the user experience of that book is just a bunch of pages. You know? I mean, and I don't mean intellectual experience, I mean user experience versus the point of the book. Like story, should story be the main thing in the game? Um, I, I believe so, yes. I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm a big believer in that that should be a big part of the game. But I, I think you're totally right. I mean, I, I think, you know, eventually we all want the holodeck, right? I mean, isn't that where we're all kind of want entertainment to be? I, I, you know, I, I think that we, we want good stories in that kind of environment. I think they'll learn to do better stories. I think it certainly is graded by its interactivity. But I mean, like some would say, hey, I go to the movies because I like the popcorn. You know, you know, I, I, like you know, everything's everybody sees different things in it. So. Okay, but can a can a game with a great story be good if the user experience is bad? Uh, yes. Um, I, gosh, I can't. I wish I could think. Of, I wish I could think of it. There's this. There's this yeah, horror. Right, 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 right. Uh, there's no. Uh, last year at the indie. What's a bad game? Vampire the Requiem Bloodline. Oh, you're just saying like playing a bad game like you go to a bad movie. No, no, I mean. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean yeah. Well, everyone would say that. I think even people that love Deadly Pre Premonition say that yeah. Deadly Premonition is a truly horrible game, right? That that the story in Deadly Premonition and its absurdity outweighs the fact that I'm doing really dumb stuff that I would never do if I didn't think the story was interesting. But is that kind of successful? I mean, that's just a Define successful. Did it make a lot of money for the for for people that needed to make a lot of money? No. Successful example of the Yeah, I mean, like, and I, I gotta tell you, I hated Resident Evil One's driving. I hated driving. I mean, I, I did not enjoy playing Resident Evil One in the like sense of like the analog stick and how it moved around. I did not like that. But like the game itself is enjoyable. I I think there can be victory, and, and you know victory has different you know different meanings to different people. Thanks, Thanks, me. it's not like it's 
it, it seems like it's not like a zero sum thing either. Like I think we can and should like have a game for games that are great like interactivity games with great stories. Like I think that is a possibility and like should be as you say, like the people are paying attention to the writers in the room as well as the people who are just looking for more technical static guy stuff. So like I, I think everybody can win in that sense. Oh yeah, I mean like I, there's guys at work go to these movies that I know are horrible, and you go like next day you're like what'd you do, and they go yeah it was horrible. Did you have a good time? I like it was a blast. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah, different, different people like different things, and even a person likes something sometimes and not you know, other times. But it's, it's it seems to me that it's uh, with games one a, a big difference between books and games is that a book might be written once and it will exist as that basically that text for possibly thousands of years, whereas video game technology a lot of times will eclipse old games, and so there's almost a shorter time period by which a game has its life. You have the memory of it, you may have sequels or new versions, but the hardware and the, the, the fact that books don't really change is a big difference there. Yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a game, I cannot think of its name right now, I think it's on my phone, I can look it up, but basically it's a game where you, you turn it on and you're a little pixel person, and then you push right, and you just start walking right, and right, and the, and time travels, and you go across sand, and you're you're gradually growing older, and growing older, you go across the sea. What passage? Yeah, exactly. And then you, you just die. <laughs> it's spoiler alert. It, 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 like, uh, but like. It has zero story. The graphics suck, right? Like the control is pushed right. Like it, there, there's nothing that sounds great about the game, but it's genius. Right? Well, I think that's well done to live on, like Noise talked about all plots and in depth. I mean, that's the, essentially the same thing. That that's that to that degree. And so on that wonderful. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming. Thanks to all the panelists. Uh,